Hey everyone, thanks for coming back to Test 2 Plus today. I'm Trace, and this week we're talking about music. This is episode four of five on music. We've talked about where it came from and the history of music, what happens in our brains when we hear music, and even what makes it popular. There are also hidden effects of music, and the most overused secret effect of listening to music is that listening to music will build your IQ, especially for babies, right? It's called the Mozart effect. And it comes where babies who listen to Mozart while in the womb are somehow magically born smarter, or that children's brains develop more fully after listening to classical music while young or while in the womb. This comes from a study published in Nature in 1993 with psychologist Francis Rauscher, and it involved 36, not babies, college kids. They listened to either 10 minutes of a Mozart sonata in D major or Nothing. They listened to complete silence. Then they performed several spatial reasoning tasks. One test, they were asked to fold up a piece of paper and then cut it and, you know, look at maybe what it looks like when it's unfolded. That's a spatial reasoning task. According to this study, which is pretty small, 36 kids, students who listened to Mozart showed significant improvement in their performance in those spatial reasoning tasks by about eight to nine spatial IQ points. And even though Rauscher's study did not correlate to intelligence in any way and did not involve babies. It was heavily commercialized. People loved the idea that if you listen to classical music, it makes you smarter somehow. And it was blown out of proportion and it was somehow linked with child development. And in 1998, former Democratic governor of Georgia, Zell Miller, mandated that mothers of newborns be given classical music CDs. In Florida, daycare centers were required to play symphonies to their toddlers. And yet, even after all that, there is no definitive evidence that playing classical music to babies in the womb will make your child smarter. And the study didn't even talk about whether you got smarter. It was just about spatial reasoning. Rauscher is now an associate professor of psychology at the University of Wisconsin in Oshkosh. And he said, when asked about this study, I would simply say there is no compelling evidence that children who listen to classical music are going to have any improvement in cognitive abilities. It's really a myth, in my humble opinion. <laughs> it is believed, though, that your baby picks up familiar tones, like the sound of your voice while in the womb. But playing music for your baby to somehow develop the baby better, that there's nothing that says that in science. And you should, though, give your baby something to listen to. You don't want to grow up in silence. So relaxing and listening to music is totally a great thing, probably better than the television. And talking to or singing with your baby around, all of those things are probably going to help because it hears the mom's voice and it can understand what's going on, and the dad's voice too. On the other hand, I'm going to back it up a bit. What about plants? Plants have been exposed to music in various scientific studies. You've probably heard about that. A study published in the Journal of Alternative and Complementary Medicine measured the biological effects of music, noise, and healing energy on seed germination. Yep, you heard it, healing energy. We're going to go there. Seed germination, by the way, is a process by which the plant grows from a seed, so it just means sprout. The study performed a series of five experiments on zucchini and okra seeds, and the idea was that they would germinate those seeds in different conditions. One condition was silence, that was supposed to be the control group. Then they had musical sound, which was a recording of improvised music played on a Native American flute. It included sounds of nature and short phrases with pauses for breath, like being in the mall when you're at the store with the rain sticks and all the little wooden trolls. That's what this is like. Then there was pink noise. That's the uh, like white noise, but a little deeper, a little warmer. And then, of course, we come to my favorite healing energy. 15 to 20 minutes, twice per day, a bioenergetic therapy was taught to the plants via transmission. I don't even know what that means. I've been doing science for three years. Basically, the people would come in and put their hands around the plants and they would project good thoughts at them, like good energy. It's thoughts. They found that musical sound had a significant effect on the number of seeds that sprouted above all other tests. And they've done tests like this throughout history. Essentially, music, for some reason, seems to help plants grow. Healing energy, pink noise, and silence, less than music. Awesome. So this has been studied elsewhere since it was first suggested in like the 1840s, the idea that plants respond to music. And 
it's pretty conclusive in this study that music has some effect on plants. But now we have to, you know, start to segregate the different types of music. You can't just say all music is good for plants, right? Because some people hate rock music or rap music or whatever kind of music you hate. And so we have to prove that classical music is better. So in 1973, researcher Dorothy Ritalik looked at rock music versus easy listening. And that kicked off a debate about which genres of music are best. Ritalik said that plants liked the easy listening better, but one could assume that Dorothy Bretalic also liked easy listening. I don't know. Maybe. A study published in the International Journal of Environmental Science and Development looked at this a little more broadly. They looked at the effect of different genres of music on 30 different rose plants, and they divided the plants into five different groups, and each group was subjected to one genre of music. Now, they weren't doing, like, country, rap, rock, classical uh, this was done in India, so they had Indian classical music. They had Vedic chants, which are particularly popular in Hinduism. They had Western classical music. Then they had rock music, and then they had silence. That was the control group. Over a period of 60 days, they looked at all sorts of different aspects of these rose plants. They looked at the elongation of the shoot of the plant, the basically the entire length of the stem. They looked at internode elongation, which is the space between the leaves. They looked at the number of flowers, the diameter of those flowers, the color of those flowers. The study found that the plants exposed to Vedic chants did the best. It had the most elongation of the shoot, the maximum number of flowers, the highest diameter of those flowers. They grew in a bushy fashion around the source of music for some reason, and the flowers uh, apparently uh, turned a nice pink. Indian classical was considered the best for the internode elongation, or the idea that there was more space between the leaves, and then Western classical and rock music sort of sucked, and the number of leaves decreased and wilted, the plants grew away from the source of music, and the flowers were red instead of pink. Now again, I want to mention these studies were done in India, so take that as you will. Like, I'm not implying research bad, but I'm sort of implying research bad a little bit. In 2007, Korean scientists found music changed the genes of their plants, causing them to grow faster, but only when exposed to certain wavelengths between 125 hertz and 250 hertz. And then there are a whole bunch of other studies. I could keep going, but I'm not going to because the music doesn't matter. That's what I'm trying to get at. Sound is important. All of these studies found that silence did not do as well as some type of smooth music. Why? Scientists have no idea. But if you had to guess, you'd probably say waves, because sound is made of wave energy, just like light energy, just like all energy in the universe. It's just moving energy. Researchers are quick to point out that sound is very similar to wind, something that plants live with all the time. So I feel like the presence of smooth sound totally makes sense. Things like a Vedic chant would be a very slow, smooth sound. Easy listening, classical, slow and smooth. Rock music is much more staccato, much more punctuated, not smooth. Plants don't experience that in the wild. What they do experience? Wind, sun, water. Makes sense. Doesn't necessarily have a scientific basis because according to UCSB, the University of California, Santa Barbara, some researchers there, there is no scientific evidence whatsoever that plants respond to music in a positive way or a negative way. They don't listen to music. Now, somebody that does listen to music or something that does is an animal. They have ears in the way that humans do, although they don't work quite the same. There are two factors that make music probably not the best for animals. First is the scale. The scales we use conform to human acoustics and vocal range. All different animals have all different vocal ranges. They all hear at different frequencies, well or poorly. And a pitch too high or low could sound grating. It could sound incomprehensible to an animal. And therefore, music that we love might sound unpleasant to your dog or to a bird. The tempo of a song also progresses for humans in the range of our heartbeat, which makes a lot of sense. Most songs are roughly 60 to 160 beats per minute. Our heart rate is between 60 and about 100. Music too fast or too slow 
we don't recognize that as music. It's just sounds, just noise. In 2009, animal psychologist at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, Charles Snowden, and a composer, David Taie, composed two songs for tamarins. Tamarins are monkeys with vocalizations a few octaves higher than our own. Maybe you'd recognize them at the zoo. They're the cute little yellow ones with the big fuzzy, they look like lions, They're called lion tamarins. That's one of the species of tamarind. They're adorable, They're really fun to watch. They're very social. They have very high octave vocalizations and their heart rates are twice as fast as ours. So if they listened to our music, it wouldn't make any sense to them. But when they wrote songs for them, they responded. The monkeys loved the songs that they wrote for them, or so they appeared to anyway. One song was modeled on excited monkey tones, and it was set to a very fast tempo, which would match their heart rate a little more, and it made the tamarins agitated and active. And then the second song that they wrote was modeled after happy monkey tones as well, but it was a slower tempo, and that caused the monkeys to calm down a little bit, and they became unusually social. Sounds like a pretty chill lounge, you know, just sitting on some wingback chairs, having a scotch, whatever. The duo went on to compose music for cats, too. They sell it online. You can buy it for your kitty cat. It's a buck ninety-nine a song. But animals can also appreciate these sounds. It's part of nature that we take in the environment around us, we listen to that, and then we process it in some way. We talked about it earlier in the brains section of this. And you probably don't think about it when it comes to your pets, right? But your pets don't hear music the same way you do. They can't. They don't experience sound the same way you do in the same way that they don't see the same way you do. I just said same way like 50 times, but I think I nailed it home. In the end, music can affect the environment all sorts of different ways. So why don't you tell me what music you listen to in the background for your plants? Do you play music for plants? Or maybe when you're studying? Let us know in the comments. And keep coming back here every day for more Test Tube Plus. I'm Trace. Thanks for tuning in.